Hello, guardians. Guardians of the forest, how are you? I hope you're all well wherever you are. I can see Tanya in a car. I can see different people joining in from different places. I see Pablo and Marie. So it's very nice to see you guys. I've just come back from Cyprus. I was uh, basking in the sun, swimming in the sea and doing some work and uh, it's wonderful. So I envy one of you who's going to Cyprus in the next couple of weeks to do some uh, wonderful work. Um, please tell us where you're joining from in the chat. Um, and you're as always very, very welcome to our live session of Guardians of the Forest. Um, this is our very last mo uh, module, sadly. Um, I can't believe we're coming to the end of this journey. Um, I think there's going to be only a few of us because it's not the usual time. Um, so it's probably going to be a slightly smaller crowd than than usual. So um, the final module of Guardians of the Forest is called Community Building. And it's perhaps one of the, uh, the most important sessions or the most important modules A lot of the work, sorry, I'm getting some messages on my screen. A lot of the work we're doing as a community of guardians relies on the strength and the power of our community to act collectively and to work collectively for a common good. And so um, the final module of our course is trying to give us some insights uh, and some knowledge around that, the power of the collective, the power of the forest as, as a community. And today we have um, two wonderful uh, masters to lead us through this process of community building. Our fi final module focuses on forests in the Indian subcontinent, Sri, Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. Today we will be in West Bengal among the Santal and Ad Adivasi communities in that part of the Indian subcontinent. And we will also be uh, discovering the Nilgala forest in Sri Lanka. So we are honored to be um, assisted and guided through today by Borobaski and Amal Disanayake, who will be sharing their experience of forest community building and forestry work in their countries, India and Sri Lanka. So I'd like, first of all, to introduce you to um, Borobaski, who will do the first of today's workshops. Borobaski is an educator and community leader from West Bengal in India. He was born in a Santal family of agricultural laborers. He's the first in his village to obtain a master's and doctoral degree. Um, and he established an NGO um, named Gosaldanga Adivasi Seva Sangha. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Boro, correct me if I didn't. Um, and he um, used the organization to provide education to Adivasi communities in West Bengal. In 1996, Boro helped set up the Rolf Schoem Vidyashram Day School um, for the Santal community. Um, and he has been working with um, different um, organizations in his community to uh, develop traditional forms of education and uh, Adivasi-based education amongst the children in, in West Bengal. Um, Boro has also worked extensively with the Department of Rural Development of West Bengal in supporting Adivasi forest communities, uh, again, to um, um, further their, their education and development. So um, without further ado, Boro, I'd like to invite you to take the floor um, and, and, and share with us. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Boro. It's a real, real honor and pleasure to have you here. Thank you. You're mute. You have to unmute yourself. So thank you, Nick, for members 
of the Guardian of the Forest. So it's my pleasure that I could be with you today and share my experience of working uh, with my people. And uh, as Nick said, I'm Boru Baski. Uh, I work in an NGO, Gushalanga Adivasi, Gushalanga Vishnubati Adivasi Trust, which is in West Bengal state of India. Uh, I live in Vishnubati, a Shantal village, uh, situated three kilometers away from Ballapur forest. I belong to Santal tribe, which is one of more than 400 different tribal groups of India, who are also called Adivasi, which means the first settlers of the country. Santal consists of about 10 million spread over eastern part of India, and they are also found in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. Nepal, and Bhutan. Originally, our ancestors were hunter gatherers, but presently we are settled agriculturists. For centuries, we have been living in various parts of the country as neighbors of other communities, maintaining cultural and social distance. This social distance has been persisting for several socio-cultural and historical reasons. One of them is the alienation of Adivasis from their traditional livelihood of Jal, Jamin, and Jungle, which means water, land, and jungle. Historically, ever since the land revenue policy known as permanent settlement has been imposed by the then British government on the land the Adivasis had been traditionally cultivating since then the tension on forest rights also began between the state and the Adivasis. This dubious relationship is still continuing even today. To safeguard tribal rights of a forest, land and the livelihood, several acts have been enacted by the Indian government, CNT, Chotunakpur Tenancy Act, Santal Pargana Tenancy Act, Pesha Forest Rights Act are some of them. However, despite those acts, the tribal rights of a forest has not been achieved. And this is because the development policies that have been taken by the government for tribals directly contradicts the socio-cultural life and livelihood of the tribal. The forest resources such as trees, animal life, landscape, water bodies, biodiversity, mineral resources are gradually being encroached upon in the name of development by corporate with support of government to build infrastructure like road, mega dams, industries, from which tribal do not get the benefit. Instead, they are being indirectly displaced from their traditional habitat. Other reasons are many tribal groups have presently adopted agriculture for their livelihood but due to out of possession of their agricultural land and unable to adapt to the transition from their non-monetary economy to the money-oriented economy has made them vulnerable to easy prey of the middleman and exploiters. Therefore, many tribal groups still rely on the traditional forest products for their livelihood. Under this complex backdrop among tribals, government, and corporate in relation to forest, forest, here I share the experience of our 
two Santal villages, Rushaldanga and Vishnubati, uh, which is which are situated near Bolapur forest, and how the community themselves have taken the initiatives to address the issues they face in their day-to-day -day life. The people of Ghosaldanga and Vishnubati are among the thousands of Santals who migrated from neighboring tribal populated state, presently Jharkhand, with dense forests and mountain during mid 90s in search of food and work. Along with their migration, they also carried along their tradition and cultural legacy of community life and social system. Santal's oral tradition of songs, folklore, and rituals help them transmit and maintain their culture and history of migration. All the rituals and festivals that we practice today still revolve around the bongas or spirits who reside in jungle, trees, water bodies, roadsides, mountains, and even animals and human bodies. We believe that people, we believe that before our settlement in the present land, the spirit have been residing here to protect this land and environment. Therefore, to live in peace, we need to appease them through various rituals and festivals throughout the year to live in harmony with them. The festivals includes our flower festivals, Baha Poro, which is celebrated in the name of Jahir Ira, the nature goddess. Most of the common trees like Mahua, Pipal, Mango, Palas, Neem, Shal, Moringa, bear new leaf, flowers or fruit. This is the time Santal believe that when the trees become reproductive, one should not disturb their body and soul by plucking or cutting off their buds, flowers, leaves, and branches. Therefore, Santal never pluck or eat the flowers or fruits of mango trees never tear of the leaves of people and neem trees, people celebrating Baha. Women do not use sal flowers in their hair for decoration, and trees are not cut for firewood at this time. Besides firewood, fra firewood, the Santal also use forests for various types of forest products, like Mahua flowers, fruits, marking nuts, aboni fruits, and fish or snails from the river Kopai that follow, flows near the forest. Manfolk too went to traditional, go to traditional religious hunting in the forest during our most important festival, Shohrai. Now I discuss mm -hmm. how. Bollapur forest is being encroached by the people who come from outside and how tribal lives are in danger because of the too much tourists and uh, visiting our villages. And uh, you now I say on this a bit, Shantini Ketan, as you have heard, is considered as one of the center of Bengali culture. Beside Tagore's University, Vishyabharati, the scenic beauty of Bollapur forest, the red soil of the region, Santa life and Baul songs have always attracted the middle class Bengali community to settle down in and around Shantri and the Bollapur forest area. In recent decades, Santiniketan has become one of the most attractive destinations for tourists. 
it is also because, because of the two most important cultural mm -hmm. events of Shantiniketan, the Pushmala and the Boshanta Ucho. Mm -hmm. The Santals too mm -hmm. have witnessed big changes in and around their villages and the forest. The changes include construction of private housing complexes, forest bungalows, eco and amusement parks, a nature museum, theater cottage and resort and so on. This directly affects the forest environment and the socio-cultural life of Santal villages. Many tourists who come to visit Shantiniketan also keep a must visit to a Santal village in the tour plan. During the weekend, the festival, the number of visitors increases who come by auto rickshaws, cycle rickshaws and cars to the villages and take photos and, and selfies. Unfortunately, the district administration encourages such Santal village tourism by putting up hoodings outside the villages. The bureaucrats have also organized artwork on the walls of the Santal houses by hiring professional painters and sculptures from outside the village, ignoring the traditional wall painting and art done by Santal dancers. Having understood the complexity related to forest and our cultural life and livelihood, we the villagers of Goshalang and Vishnubhati has have tried to address our problems to our village organization, Goshaldanga Vishnubhati Adivasi Trust since last 30 years. In eight, 1987, Tree plantation was the first program that the villagers unanimously adopted along with two other important programs, namely education and health. Having agreed with the idea of planting trees, the villagers collected the seeds from the trees and grew them nursery. They planted the sampling and guarded them from cows and goats in turn. And within 10, to 15 years, the barren land of our area turned to a greenery and villagers' dependency on the Bollapur forest, especially for firewood, reduced. Earlier, they used to spend half a day or even whole day to collect a bag full of dry leaves or bundle of twigs after walking six kilometers up and down. Now they collect the same from the surrounding of the villages, saving much time and energy. As the trees grew big, they also attracted the greedy eyes of timber businessmen of the area. The trees that grew, we consider as host of our spirits and a source of our livelihood, they see as opportunity to make money. In 2010, 11, the local leaders in league with the local administration proposed to us to cut all the trees on the roadside and plant new ones. The money would be divided between our villages and them. We called village meeting and as, and as expected, we rejected the proposal of cutting the trees as we know from our previous experiences that after cutting the trees, they would forgot their promise. The conflict developed with the local political party leaders. We had several meetings together and in each meeting, they came with goons and weapons like pistol bombs to create pressure on us to cut the trees. Once they also attacked the school of our organization with bombs and we had to suspend all our activities for more than a month. Finally, we approached the district administration and submitted mass petition for the safety of our villages, trees, and our environment. 
the people from six villages of the area also created pressure on the top leaders of the party and they finally retreated. The trees on the roadside are still standing even now, which remind us of our community's strength and unity. After the conflict with local political leaders, the organization put more effort to educate the people of the villages about the forest and the value of tree in human life to our non-formal Santal school, the Rolf Shams Vidarshan, and the Museum of Santal Culture that the organization has established in the villages in the village Vishwamati. In our school, the Santa children took education through their mother tongue in the beginning. And gradually, they marched into the mainstream languages, Bengali and English, and to the subject like math, science, geography, history, and so on. Beside these mainstream subjects, subjects we have also introduced the subjects that are directly related related with the community such as agriculture, biofarm, beekeeping, vermicompost, fishery, etc. The school has a big campus where all these programs are looked after by the students and teachers of the school. In the museum, we have displayed more than 150 Santal cultural items, which includes musical instruments, hunting materials, herbal medicines, braids and ornaments, and photographs of Santal life of more than 100 years. Through the museum, we teach our students about the rich cultural heritage of our tribe and the knowledge they acquired over generations for sustainable livelihood in communion with nature. So uh, this is my presentation. Now I will show you some photos uh, related to the topic that I just uh, uh, discussed. So this is uh, Bollapur forest. So you can see uh, our village is uh, three kilometers away from this forest. And uh, this is another site of the forest. And this is our village, Vishnubati. You can see the main road and uh, most of the houses are uh, of mud. This is here where I grew up, last road. And our villages, we have a village meeting uh, in the village when we have some problems. We sit together, man and woman and discuss. Village women sitting, preparing brooms, the grass. This is also other side of our village street. Here we use plow. So this is the, I have taken it from the internet, the Santal life. Of the world, and uh, here how the corporate taking over the Santal villages. You see, this is a Santal village, and the company has already acquired the land adjacent to that village. And uh, here, I have visited this village. In fact, I worked in that in this area as a government official three years. And uh, I know this area very well. And, uh, 
this is how this is how mining will be done here beside a santal village the work has started here and the company also put up a statue um, at the construction site of two santal heroes uh, to convince the people that how uh, important you are and uh, we give respect to your life and your heroes so thus they have put up the statue beside the village and this is our baha ritual baha festival as i said going on in the village the man and woman they are dancing In the ritual site this is just addition to the wallapur forest how the bungalows are coming up and you can see how many foods and people so many posters are given there uh, inviting tourists from um, city and uh, there is written wallapur uh santal village you are welcome to visit this village put up by the state administration so see this is a santal village normally santal paint their villages in their own way but they have uh, hired the professional artists and colored all the walls in same color so you can see the road how ugly it looks uh, and the color also so i come to my village in 1991 we had a meeting with the villagers that we will address this issue that we are facing so we need to plant trees and start our school of our own so this is how beside the river side we started planting trees that was 30 years back all the villagers and children were planting trees you can see here these are all old photos and now we can see the trees how they have grown up and these are the trees the the local hmm, timber merchants they wanted to and we have several kilometers long one road where we have planted trees and also beside the river side now you can see the trees all around the children of our village playing football this is our school there are some vidyashram or santal school the children learn through their own mother tongue and gradually switch over to the mainstream languages and we have also incorporated our folklore our history our music and dance in our curriculum students also work in the garden we have a peak campus this is the museum this is inside the village villagers they themselves look after the museum inside the museum so with the students we also uh, take the pro program for awareness program for planting trees and to the villages the students and slogans this uh, uh, 
tradition that we started of planting trees 30 years ago is still continuing. These are new generations and every year we plant trees. Before going to plant trees, we have a village meeting. This is the last June's photos I have taken. And from every family, one has to take uh, one sapling. One, and in the name of their family, they have to plant one tree. So that is here we are having meeting. So villagers are getting ready to plant trees. You can see the roadside, the small children, they are collecting seeds, uh, which they will plant. This is we are we have a big barren land near the river, so we are going there. Even the small children, they also take part. So planting trees is a celebration actually every year that we do in June and, uh, and also in 15th of August for Independence Day. Yeah, so um, I guess uh, I think I have little time left, Nick. Yes, you still have um, five, ten minutes, Borough. Yeah. But it... So just I have some uh, videos which I have already. This is the so this is not a santal art. These are not santal art, but um, And I will the village I showed where a company has started. I showed you in still photos of the Santa village. Boro, could you say a little bit about the site? What what the the timber company expects to do with that that site? It looks quite yeah, devastated. Uh, uh, this is a coal mine company that they have found. It, it, here there was a forest you can see, and uh, they have discovered that uh, there is coal here. So now um, they want to dig it up. And uh, they have somehow convinced, convinced some villages with the money. So divide and rule policy, as you know. So some people supported the project because they feel that this is good for us. It will bring uh, cash. But of course, some, especially the old people, they don't want to leave their village because this is not only their, uh, it is not only the forest, but as I said, uh, it is where their ancestors live and their spirits live. So it's an emotional part and also part of the livelihood. And uh, um, we're gonna go into questions later, but I, I'm, I'm very curious to know 
how has the introduction of you you mentioned it in your presentation the introduction of a, a money economy uh, disturbed the community cohesion to what extent has the buying out of certain members of the community caused conflict internally could you say a little bit about that yeah because uh, uh, the company when company comes uh, uh, it's always uh, in, in in collaboration with the local political leaders because it controls the area and uh, and uh, these political leaders also have influence in the villages because through them only they get all the government facilities and uh, so they, they just can't ignore them. And, uh, and these people, they don't know about the rights, about the forest rights acts that they have. But, uh, and since they, these villages are situated far away from the uh, cities and the education level is very low. So they're, they, these leaders are the first people who always are in contact with them and also the government officials also uh, with them. So this is how things going on. And this is this is the place where I have already worked and so I know very well. So that's it, uh, Nick. I think uh, I here I end my presentation. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, Boro. Thank, thank you so much. I um it was wonderful to get a glimpse of the reality of the Santala Divasi and the strength, really, um, the, 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 the power and the strength. People use the word resilience. I sometimes find it's been overused. It's just the enormous spiritual and family strength to, to continue um, a way of life despite the, the political, economic, social, cultural, spiritual um, difficulties. So um, I can see just by the images you showed the enormous uh, strength. Um, and I know you've done um, almost superhuman work. You know, sometimes one person can do so much to, to support the community by, you know, creating an NGO, by creating a, a local school, by creating a, a local museum precisely to, to give strength to your community so that you can continue um, living with the forest as opposed to against the forest, as, as those corporations you showed us are trying to do, is to set the very communities against their own forest. So thank you, Boro. Um, I'm sure our guardians will have loads of questions to ask us. Your presentation was very, very rich. It touched on loads of different aspects of forest guardianship and the role of communities. So, I'm really looking forward to opening the floor uh, later on. Uh, guardians, if you have any questions, please you know jot them down uh, or keep them for the Q and A session that will be coming up very shortly. <clears throat> Just going to take a second now to introduce our next speaker. Amal, are you with us? Yes, I am. So. Amal Disanayaka is an action researcher from Colombo in Sri Lanka. He obtained a bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Ruhuna and a certificate in anthropology from the University of Queensland in Australia, as well as an MA in sociology from the University of Colombo. Um, at the moment, Amal is a researcher at the Hector Kobakadua Agrarian Research and Training Institute, which is also based in, in Colombo. He's a member of the Committee on Managing Wildlife Crop Damages in Rural Agrarian Areas and the Ministry of Culture. And he has specialized in human wildlife conflict, particularly around human elephant relations in the forested areas of, of his country. Um, Amal was the first yeah. guardian that I met when uh, curating this, this course. 
uh, Amal was introduced to me by a common friend of ours, Lisi Oriel, who was originally curating this, this course. So Amal, you are the first, but you're not the last. And thank you so much for being here with us. It's, uh, it's yeah. wonderful to have you here, my friend. And we're really looking forward to for you to share us all, all, all your knowledge about the Nilgala forest in Sri Lanka. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nick. Maybe the last, but latest, I think. <laughs> the latest. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and uh, hi, and good morning, and good evening for the entire world. I know there are a lot of people from a lot of countries, so sometimes maybe night, maybe dawn, maybe day. Yeah, you all are welcome. And I'd like to share my experiences uh, while uh, sharing my experiences. Um, I will use a presentation, PowerPoint presentation. I think it uh, would be easy to uh, follow and follow our discussion. Right, uh, without wasting time, let's uh, jump into the presentation, okay? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, right. Uh, here are the contents. It's for my convenience. I think uh, don't take uh, <coughs> seriously, <laughs> not like a lecture. Uh, here, what Nick asked me to do, because I'm uh, as a social researcher, so I work with uh, indigenous people in this particular area, which calls Nilgala Forest in Sri Lanka. So. And there are uh, some beautiful uh, stories to share with you, uh, experience to share with you. So I light up for my presentation like this. Uh, I'm uh, talking about some more things about the indigenous communities, of Sri Lanka and the forest, and uh, their current situation and challenges and community organizing issues and all the things, right? Let's move on to the the slide, I would like to pay your attention uh, to my country and the uh, distribution of indigenous community. They are, here are the spots and uh, where we found, we can find, uh, we could find the indigenous people in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, there are two main uh, divisions of uh, such people. We generally they, we call Vedas people. And uh, one of them, uh, uh, the coastal Vedas, they are living in coastal areas, and others are, we call the Radha Pravedas, that's uh, one of the cities. And uh, people and the scientists believe they are, and centuries come from that city, and so we call them non Radha Pravedas. Simply, they are food, they are not living in coastal area and in the country. And uh, country. Actually, uh, they have such a long history. Inhabitant from prior to sixth uh, century before Christ, they have such a long history, but they are represented very small amount of the, the Sri Lankan community, just 0.005% of the total population. So uh, on your left, uh, he's the he's the most famous uh, indigenous leader of the country, Tisahami, also like the uh, Seattle in USA. He fight uh, for their rights and uh, their community. And uh, now, at on your right side, uh, the Vanilato is there. He is the current leader. Here, yeah, as I uh, showed you in this first map, we could found uh, some uh, regional, uh, some regions. They have scattered. They have concentrated. And all the region points, they have regional leaders. This is the. Ratugala for uh, Nilgala forest. So and Nilgala and Ratugala then both are village. So and uh, Nilgala forest is what we are paying attention today. So and uh, on your left hand side you can see the person, uh, top naked person, and uh, he's the regional leader of uh, Nilgala area among the uh, traditional community. So uh, he's the Him Bandilato, and they have some. They have their different language and their own way of uh, names, their own uh, practices in religion, and all the things they have. 
store and uh, you can see then your teacher is discuss, having a discussion with that uh, regional leader. And the uh, right hand side uh, image, uh, you can see the forest. Actually, it's a very dense forest and uh, rich of uh, uh, high biodiversity. Sri Lanka is one of the countries with the higher uh, biodiversity. So uh, this forest uh, approximately to 26,000 hectares and uh, flora and fauna both it's important in both two ways. And it's moderately cool forest. And uh, the special thing is this forest, that is a medicinal forest that contains 95% of medicinal plants. So, uh, which are used to Ayurvedic medicine, such, me uh, such plants materials, and the people collect them and sell uh, to the uh, entrepreneurs to produce some um, salt and uh, or the medicines and like that. So there are the uh, common income ways of such people. So, and uh, in a uh, long history of Sri Lanka, then uh, we have written evidences and uh, people also believe this forest is not a, not an actual forest, that's a, uh, some kind of man-made forest. Because uh, we had a king which calls good King Buddha Dasa, so he's, uh, he's very famous, in, uh, he's a doctor, and he's very famous in medicine. He established a number of hospitals based on the Arabic medicine. So he maintained different uh, forests to uh, cultivate medicinal plants. Then people believe this forest is uh, such a forest among his project. So, yes, this is the turning point of this area. Uh, the Galloway National Park, and uh, I'm talking about the Galloway project, that uh, you can see some reserve area on the top image, uh, in the right-hand corner. And uh, you also can see some mountains, that the mountain area where there is the Nilgala forest is located. So that this entire area was a, a large forest when 1950s. The government started the Galloway project. That's a multi-dimensional project. Uh, uh, it uh, focuses to increase the cultivation area, introduce the sugarcane industry and hydropower as, uh, as well as settle some uh, people uh, from uh, highly dense, uh, High dense, uh, highly populated areas. They, they bring some families from highly populated areas and just resettle that families, that area. That's a multi dimensional, multi purpose project. So, in uh, that case, this uh, reserve or this tank is the major component. It is the driving force of this project. So, they need to uh, demarcate a catchment area for this project, for this reserve. So for um, subject to its smoothly functioning of this agriculture project. So they grabbed the entire area of Nilgala forest and demarcated and gasped it and uh, uh, published it as a national park. So in case of that, the indigenous people, the Vedas people had to come outside the forest. Before in before uh, introducing that national park, they were living in, inside the forest. They had a close relationship with the forest, right? Then at the top bottom image, you can see the first prime minister who calls uh, the Senanayaka, then the Risevi also named as Senanayaka Samudra. So uh, now it has a long history. Now we can see the consequences of this project. So. This is the point where indigenous people separated from the forest. The government asked them to live separately and uh, yeah, keep maintaining your deals with some restrictions. So uh, I would like to uh, refresh your mind into the inauguration lecture of this inauguration session of this program, uh, the Vandana Shiva from India. She uh, coined uh, some interesting term about environmental appetite. So the appetite is the, it, 
the word uh, originated from South Africa based on the racism, uh, the national, uh, yes, the racism though. But not only that's not only applicable for the human beings, but all the animals, all the creatures. Yeah, that's actually true. We are admiring the consequences of these apartheid practices of environment and the human. So then uh, when we are talking about uh, the, uh, the indigenous community, uh, community, their livelihoods are uh, really based on this forest. Then government asks them to uh, come out and settle. They provide some village area and some uh, some uh, bursaries to build up uh, houses and uh, other infrastructure. So, and uh, what happened? But government uh, permitted them to. Okay, the indigenous people are. Uh, 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 permitted, uh, further permitted to enter that forest area to call, uh, to collect some uh, bee honeys and the bumblebee honeys and medicinal plants and medicinal goods and uh, wrapping leaves. And the wrapping leaves is one of the main industry here because uh, I think you may know sometimes uh, about it's a kind of a cigarette or, and uh, the leaves in this forest, they, they're very famous for their use in, to wrap that cigar, wrap that cigarettes. So uh, and that uh, leaves have higher demand, especially from Nilgala. So uh, that the livelihoods of the uh, indigenous people are uh, based on the, this collection cultivation, but they are, are, they are practicing hunting or gami uh, and the chenna cultivation, but they are not for profit or earn, they're just for their survival. But uh, they earn some by that livelihoods. So I think you, you, you may have some idea or a great idea than me about the chenna cultivation. Uh, we call it chenna cultivation in Sri Lanka and uh, it's a very uh, popular among the world and uh, slash and burn cultivation. So that's a very historical practice in Sri Lanka. Yeah, the people uh, go to the forest and select uh, some land plot to cultivate and they uh, cut all the trees, not all the trees, but the uh, lower layer or the middle layer, they, uh, they do not usually, they don't to cut down the uh, very old and tall trees. So they clear the uh, middle and uh, grasswood layer and uh, let them dry for a few days and set them fire so that uh, thereafter they uh, cultivate they establish their uh, cultivation land and start cultivate so after the uh, harvesting they uh, come back to the home and after spelling that land they are not going to that land again for another five ten years that's called the slash and burn cultivation it's uh, continued as a secular so people are rotating around the forest. Normally in this area, the uh, indigenous community and some of the local communities are practice this slash and burn cultivation. So during these practices, they have their own set of norms, principles, and some regulations like, right? Then uh, when we're talking about the slash and burn cultivation, they will, they built a buffer, buffer area around the land plot. They totally cleaned it. So they do not any of dry leave on that buffer area because they know if fire just passes that area, the entire forest will be burned. So they, another thing is then they set on the fire against the wind, not according to the wind, against the wind. They have such norms. So and before uh, setting on fire, they have, they are singing some special songs or some chapters because they want to uh, exceed all the animals from such particular area because they have, they show somewhat of uh, good ethics, right? Even though they are indigenous or local. So, in that case, the uh, government totally banned this slash and burn uh, 
cultivation. So uh, what would be the result? So actually, people uh, been practicing for a long time. Then the, this is the forest. Uh, please pay attention on this image. You can see some tall trees, and uh, but uh, there are no their babies like small plants or at least seedling. Yes. After removing people from the forest, after banning the slash and burn cultivation, there were no second or third generations of such medicinal plants. The scientists were really, uh, actually they, they, they were wondered about this result. What is they're going to the forest and start some uh, experiments. What they found was really miracle thing. These medicinal plants are, have seeds. The seed, the crust of that seeds are very thick and very strong. The, in case of fire, that crust made weaker. The high temperature can weak the crust and it will increase the germination rate of that seed. So in this case, the farmers didn't enter to the forest. This it would it had been a trouble for existence of these trees, especially the medicinal trees. So that's only one thing. Another thing, increasing of forest smuggling, because uh, when the indigenous people are in inside the forest, they are living inside the forest. Actually, uh, they protect according to them. They protect their forest because the smugglers cannot enter there because they are the guardians for this forest. They are, actually they collect something and even though they're hunting or gaming or clubs, they didn't allow to a mass level of uh, extractions like minerals or timber or like that. Then uh, after introducing the environmental appetite, the people are living out of the forest. They don't think the forest is for us. We are, the guardians of forest or like that, no such minds. They think it's just a property of the government. So it's, we are not allowed to go there. Even though we are allowed to go there for small activities. So now and then uh, people who are practicing the chain of cultivation out of the boundary, they do not much consider about that practices, their ethics, which practiced by for fathers. So as a result, therefore, the wildfires. Why people uh, think like that, don't think uh, like their forefathers. Now they, they feel, they feel this property is somebody else. Forest is somebody else. The government established fence, electric or some uh, physical fence. And or they ask us to stay outside, they ask animals to stay inside. So people uh, have no chance to increase their own mind to love that forest. And another thing is disruption of the human animal cohabitation. It's, it's all one of the consequences of this area. Because uh, the weather's people, uh, they practice the gaming. So uh, in some context, uh, they uh, practice, their, they use an axe, and there's a traditional uh, tool and uh, bow and arrow, they usually use such tools and they targeted the animals. For example, one, the one indigenous person, the clever hunter, he told me they, they don't uh, kill all the animals they see. For an example, in group of deers, so they select the oldest male deer, oldest male deer. How they find this? I will show you later. They had their, they had their knowledge. They, they know they are. Uh, they have studied about. They have studied about the antlers, the growing and removing the antlers. After removing the main antler, main set of antler they will have a small antler. They have a special word uh, for that uh, deer and they give a priority to that deer 
in hunting. So they know that this will be, uh, this will uh, make minimum impact to this bunch of deers. So that's they, even though they uh, practice in hunting, uh, they have, they had, and they have very uh, important part of ethics. So I would like to share uh, one story with you and uh, uh, because uh, just uh, limiting just after limiting these activities the government uh, observed that uh, indigenous people are uh, they they are in trouble with uh, having their proteins to uh, increase the level of protein to their meals their community in trouble so the government asked this people uh, this community to uh, introduce a special program. Uh, before that, I would like to say that uh, indigenous community, the Vedas people have been labeled in society as savage group because they are hunting uh, and uh, they are living in forest. So people concern they are savage. So, and uh, according to that uh, government decision, uh, the poultry, special poultry farming and uh, some uh, cattle farming uh, were introduced to that uh, community. And uh, one of our senior officers went to that village and introduced to the poultry farming. And there was a village meeting with indigenous people. Then uh, they asked to, uh, there are the equipment and you can bring them in. You can uh, build cages and put these chicks there and you can get uh, eggs and finally you can uh, kill them and uh, you can eat them. Yeah. Then and, uh, at the end of that meeting and uh, the leader of that community asked, sir, are you uh, asked us to kill this animal? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Even though it's government property, you can kill and eat them. So how, can kill, how we can kill them? Because we feed them, we take care of them. We are the guardians of them. After getting mature, can I kill them? Then that officer said that to me, I was questioned by myself, who are the savages? So actually, let's move into the next, we are patient after that story. So, and, uh, However, that uh, program wasn't successful because that's out of their mindset of minds. So, and uh, thereafter, uh, government uh, and the, some organizations, especially UK program and uh, Canadian Embassy and Sri Lankan uh, Forest uh, Department uh, got together and started a uh, community organizing concept. So in that concept, uh, this is uh, how that uh, concept elaborates. I think I already shared this, uh, uh, I extract these images from uh, one of the reports uh, by, uh, produced by IUCN. So, and uh, you also can refer that report in that uh, reading materials. Uh, this is the way where uh, the Ratugala and Ilgala forest, we, uh, organize the community. You can see number of uh, small circles because uh, we uh, use the number of circles. Then in, in every society, in every village has different groups. Uh, it based on sometimes based on caste, based on religion or, or based on their beliefs and gender. So an age, so in a, all a representation should be there and we design in, uh, several groups into one umbrella organization. And uh, actually, this is the village level. So uh, after selecting them, we got consent in one uh, direction to all community. And thereafter, we amalgamate that umbrella organization with the uh, government uh, institutes. The uh, government institutes means they are actually, we, they are the uh, service providers, but they are not decision makers the wildlife department, forest department, and uh, public administration. So their service providers, 
they are the service providers, which means uh, uh, they can uh, facilitate people. They can work together with people. But another party is missing here. So that's the uh, uh, kind of uh, yeah decision makers here. Now the amalgamation is completed. Then divisional secretariat, livelihood officer, and agricultural officer. They can uh, decide what we should do with the people and with the facilitating organization. So uh, what the interesting thing is doing, uh, they introduce a medicinal plant community here. So medicinal plant community means the, uh, the indigenous people, not only uh, for the indigenous people, but also another local communities can participate there. They can, uh, they are, the government ask uh, they to, uh, ask them to go to the forest and collect seeds of that uh, plants and uh, give them to the forest department. They are handling a large, small seed bank and small nursery and uh, they uh, synthetically increase their imagined, um, germination rate and uh, make some plants. And after getting matched, uh, after, they, after the common seedlings out, so they go, to the, go back to the forest and plant them again. That is how they refill the uh, vacuum of uh, germination and uh, second, third generations of that plant, that uh, forest, uh, by uh, using the power of the community. So however, this practice was started with the combination of a uh, number of non-government to uh, sector organizations. Um, but actually at the uh, current, currently, and in the, in when I'm discussing about the present situation, this practice is um, actually disappeared. And I'm really uh, sad to hear that. So uh, here, right, I make some pictures from one of the Sri Lankan research reports. Then this knowledge look and uh, how identify their age and uh, maturity. So farmers and indigenous people, when they are going to uh, hunting, they had this knowledge. We made, uh, we uh, done number of research for years and years and generate this knowledge. Look, they, are, they have this traditional knowledge in their mind, uh, not only in this, but also as, as, as I explained uh, in the uh, increase in the germination rate. They, uh, Actually, whether they have this knowledge or not, they practice well, what we call their indigenous knowledge. So this indigenous knowledge actually supported to the uh, optimum existence of this forest. Shall I move that for right, right. And uh, what I told you, this uh, community organization practice is not being practiced well currently because of some issues. So, um, I would like to pay your attention uh, here. The government uh, has withdrawn the circular uh, file of 2001. Uh, this is special circular regarding the residual forest. In Sri Lanka, we have special forest area which calls residual forest. This forest, uh, they are not uh, conserved area. People and animal can uh, uh, can utilize this area. There is no much restrictions, but no one can use there for this area for the commercial purposes. Even people can practice chain cultivation there, but not uh, without using heavy vehicles, heavy equipments. So uh, in last year, government re uh, withdrew that circular and uh, gave the uh, they gave total power remove the power from the forest department and gave that power to the uh, regional authorities like divisional secretariat and uh, regional secretariat to uh, lease out these lands for long-term businesses, entrepreneurs. In case of that, the people are really dissatisfied because uh, now people don't think these properties for us, the, this forest for us and uh, they think they are the properties of someone else sometimes whether the government or company come to that area that's the that company's property 
So an animals have uh, no enough room. They have no enough area to feed and habitat. So in case of that, now it's increasing. And this indigenous uh, uh, community, they have a strong power for a long period. Uh, when uh, Sri Lanka becomes a British colony, so there were a few uh, upheavals, there were a few uh, wars in between local communities and the uh, British rulers. So, and uh, these indigenous people had played a uh, wonderful role in that battles. So they, uh, they are actually, uh, there are some prominent leaders of them. So, and uh, after that war, uh, after that battle, the, the British uh, rulers brought their schools to the UK and uh, for some investigations or something like that. And they were in the Edinburgh uh, Museum and recently they returned to the Sri Lanka, actually returned to their leader, the country leader of the community, uh, leader of the indigenous people, went to the London and they, he handed over that schools. Actually, they had a great history. So their community organization has such a long history. This shows, this image shows that. Then uh, currently, <clears throat> that process has been uh, put into the trouble because of some decisions of the government. So uh, consequently, consequently, there are some uh, conflicts between indigenous people and local people and uh, between them and the entrepreneurs and some local people as well. And uh, I would like to pay attention to some videos regarding that. And uh, Nick, shall we play the two video? Sure. Which one do you want me to play first? I think uh, we play first the uh, wildfire. Okay. Just give me one sec. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Should I stop share my screen? Yes, please. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Nika, yes. can can I can I explain while playing the video? Sure. This is the okay. right video. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. My friends, uh, this is the Nilgala forest area. So uh, the wildfires are, it's a very frequent circumstance in this area, especially uh, because of the vegetation type. This forest contains a savanna type of, uh, savanna type of grass layer while having uh, some tall trees. In case of that, at the dry seasons, the frequent wildfires occurred in this forest. Actually, there are so many officers. This is a very recent incident, mid of this year, I think. Uh, these officers are blaming the people around this forest. Uh, why they are blaming? People are depending on this forest and they are not supporting to the put off the fire. How did it happen? Does the community organization part the process? Okay, Nick. Shall I play the other one? Uh, wait, I think I uh, want to say something, but 
Okay, yeah. okay, let's let, let's watch uh, two videos once and after we have discussion. Okay. You can play another one. Do you want to speak over it? It's probably better, no? No, no. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I want to speak. Please uh, minimize. This is the can you hear me yes yeah this is this is the uh, leader of that indigenous people community you can see where who's where in Lunji. and uh, there is a some conflict in between them some uh, hotel owner of this area and the traditional people but, uh, this is a news reporting in uh, Sri Lanka. So they have cut down trees to um, build their hotel, and this community leader and the local people um, came against them, and there was a conflict. So he explained that they. He explained that they have life traits. So uh, <clears throat> they shows there's a hotel in that area. So okay, me. Let's pause this video. <clears throat> Thanks, Samal. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yeah, out. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I, I just wanted to uh, pay attention to that videos. Now the we had actually we had a good call, community organization uh, process in practice, but uh, because of uh, some critical decisions of the recent recent past critical decision of the current government. So uh, the indigenous communities, as well as all the local communities, put into the trouble, are uh, because the large-scale uh, entrepreneurs and tradesmen, especially hotels and uh, agriculture project owners, they are coming to that area. Not only for this particular area, but all around the country, it's happening. Come to that area, and they um, they utilize that uh, residual forest area as they are so the mindset of the people to save the forest and save the animal or and save the nature is rapidly decreasing so this has become a big challenge for the people as well as all the forest guardians so and uh, Nick, I think I have elaborated my idea through the session. Uh, what about the time we consume? Yeah, maybe maybe it's a good moment to start a QA. Are you are you okay with that, Amal? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, great, thank you. Um, thank you so much for uh, for your presentation, Amal. Um, again a very vivid picture of just how how difficult how um fraught with conflict the the work of uh, forest guardians is in sri lanka and just how vital it is to have indigenous and traditional ecological knowledge at the heart of that that uh, process um and how community building is also central to any work of um protection and guardianship of the forest. So thank you. It was very vivid and also echoes a lot of the things that Bora was saying earlier around the threats posed by developers, by extractivist industries like mining and, and industrial timber, um, and the kind of the conflict of values that, that the forest throws up between those who see it as a resource and as a commodity and those who see it as life and a spiritual home. 
Um, so thanks for that. Um, my first question to both of you is uh, obviously about the community. Um, I've got several questions about the community, and I, I love the 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 flow diagram that you shared with us, um, Amal. I think I think that is actually very very useful, and it's something that I've been thinking about about quite a lot in the past months, um, as we've been journeying through the the different presentations that we've heard. How can a community such as ours, Guardians of the Forest, be of use or or or, or meaning or, or or facilitate transformation for communities on the ground. So I saw there, Amal, that you put the, the various different circles that make up a local village community, women groups, children groups, religious groups, etc., and then this umbrella organization. How how does that happen? How do you create an, an umbrella organization? To support a village? It's a question for both of you, Bora and, and Amal. Do you have experience of having set up an umbrella organization? And if so, what would be your advice in terms of being able to create such an umbrella organization that can bring all the different you know, voices and the richness and diversity of interests in a village to a kind of forum? How do we do that? Bora, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you, Nick. I think um, the importance of the work uh, is how to share the ideas to others and how others can take the idea that one is successful working. So that is always uh, in our mind, whatever um, uh, projects we have taken from our organization or from our village community, our approach was from the beginning that to inspire the community, inspire the people mm -hmm. around us by seeing the work that we are doing or one particular village, villages, village communities doing, rather than going to them and working with them. Of course, we share the ideas, we explain with them, but to inspire them and so that they can start of their own uh, according to the problems according to the situation that they have. And uh, for example, we are working for last 30 years and uh, uh, there are dozens of tribal villages, even non-tribal villages are here. And uh, whenever we take some program, we always invite them. We invite them and we create occasions, always create occasion and give a you know, festive type of environment. We have a festival, for example, spring annual spring festival we have celebrated. Also tree plantation And uh, we invite the local schools so that the teachers can send their children because we believe that the, uh, educating children about the forest, about the tree, should start from the child onwards. It is like like learning maths, mathematics. You know, you have to do it very systematically, and uh, you have to relate the thing with their own life. So that they can relate with their own life, how it is, how it is uh, creating problem in their life, and how it will go in future. Mm. Uh, and and it worked in our villages when they saw that trees are being cut. Our women have to go to the forest uh, to bring firewood and to collect fruits and leaves and other forest products. 
then they they realize then it is easy to understand the um, program rather than just telling them the idea uh, and that is working and uh, until now in our school we have more than 14 now uh, 14 different from 14 different villages the students are coming so we are not only creating programs for the student but also of the parents they also create education of the parents but parents also can take part in planting trees and working in the school campus so uh, it's a it's a very um, planned approach and we are doing and uh, it it's a time taking process it doesn't come uh, we one or two years or three years, maybe for life. It's, mm. it's an ongoing a struggle. Uh, and uh, when you see this whole thing that way, I think uh, the frustration that we get will be a bit. Because yeah, the, whatever we see, so it is, we have to understand that it's a matter of conflict of ideas, values, perspectives, so many things working here. And uh, we have to change this to education. And education should start from the school. Yeah. It's, um, I, I have so much to say about that, but uh, I, I will refrain. So, Boro, um, Amal, would you like to respond to the, the question? Yeah, of course, Nick. And um, especially we are working in uh, developing countries like Asia, Africa, or Latin America. There are so many social divisions. We can found it. So when you are, you, are, you are just talking about umbrella organization, what's the role of that organization? So we can see some uh, horizontal divisions and uh, central divisions are like caste, religion, and uh, wealthiness, right? Mm -hmm. So in especially in such type of area, in rural elites and untouchables. So we have to work uh, all together with, uh, with this, the entire group. Otherwise, our, our objective will be spoiled. So another important thing is uh, making uh, umbrella organization. So people should have uh, then every each and every human being, the people really want to uh, be a part of decision making. So inherently, inherently, people want to get that experience. So we have to have give them opportunity to take part in this decision making uh, process. So this umbrella type organization will provide good platform to or discuss their issues and uh, elaborate their ideas and uh, finally collective decision as a whole. So in such case, people will think this is our effort. So we should protect this. We should uh, save this, we should help this. Uh, I would like to share uh, one uh, slide. This is one of another presentation. Uh, can I, share this uh, Nick, because I think it's very important in the community organizing. Of course you can share it by all means. Yeah. Can you see? Uh, not yet. Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, this is one of my another presentation uh, part of my presentation, uh, which I made on the uh, human elephant conflict conference. So I'm just comparing the two electric fences in uh, Sri Lanka. The one electric fence you can see the both electric fences are uh, established or uh, between village and the tank or the lake. So uh, what the one electric fence is being used as the cloth line. The lady used this uh, electric fence to make dry their clothes. So another village, 
the people voluntarily, uh, the farm organization, the, they voluntarily make a roster to uh, protect the, this fence, even though we have electric fences and, and elephants come into the area and uh, put some dry timbers or dry items. They use some uh, uh, dry things and break down the electric fences. So uh, especially at the night, people have to protect it. That uh, the government established the electric fence, but uh, farmers voluntarily uh, develop a roster, roster system and they protect uh, this elephant fence. So, but uh, in this case, it's not happened like that. The, when uh, the wildlife department establishing this electric fence, they disrupt the uh, people way of access to the tank because these are very dry areas. People have not much options. So they are depending on a tank. Uh, they, had, they have to give some space to people as well. So people do not think this is for us. This is only for us. So then how people's mindset, if uh, all the parties come into the village and had a discussion, which is the suitable place, uh, we, where, where should we, uh, we, we, we should uh, allocate for the people, which area should allocate to the animal. If they um, had such a discussion, uh, this result will not be uh, happen. And uh, do the communities agree with the setting up of these electric fences to keep elephants away? In the first place, are they are they in agreement, and is it a consensual decision of the government to set up these these uh, electric fences? Sorry, Nick, I didn't get you. Could you repeat? No, I was asking. Clear. So, as as I understand what you're showing, these are electric fences set up by the government to keep elephants away from um, water uh, bodies and 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 um, agricultural areas. Do the do the communities themselves agree? to the setting up of these fences? Yes, in they, that uh, in the right hand picture, they had, they, even they had, had an ang agree, even they had an agreement, uh, they didn't come to the, uh, the forest department didn't come to the village before establishing the fence and they didn't have a meeting with people. So they came uh, suddenly and get a decision and establish the fence. But another site, another village, uh, they came and uh, had a good discussion with the people and people themselves uh, uh, develop a roster to protect the fence. I so, see. Then, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. The, that's the importance of the community. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you stop sharing, Emma? Is that yeah, okay? I, I, I stopped it. Um, as, as I'm trying to um, integrate both your, your responses and, I, and um, what I was thinking as you were both talking is that you've kind of given two different ways in which community can, can uh, be strengthened and fortified through a, a moving inwards, if you like, um, a focusing on the internal strengths of, of, a, of a community, especially nursing the community. By, by focusing on education, children, and the earth itself as a, as, 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 a, as, a, as a school. You know, the nursing of plants and what you were saying, Boro, of, of teaching forestry as though it was maths. The nursing of children and the nursing of the earth go hand in hand for the, the building of community. It's a kind of strengthening the community from within. And then we've got this sort of strengthening of the community as, a, as something that grows outwardly um, and which finds strength by representation and political um, voice, this kind of growing outwards, which is what you were uh, saying, um, Amal. And it seems to me that it, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but community has to grow in, in those, both, in both those directions. It cannot insulate itself from the outside completely. It cannot sort of close its shut its eyes from all those forces, external forces that are uh, descending upon it, whether they're the extractivists or the developers or, 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 or political authorities. There has to be a way in which the community can interact with those forces externally. And nor can it forget that it all comes from that education, 
So it seems like there's this kind of two way effort going on. And it's not easy. It's very difficult to do both things at the same time. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you, Boro, how, how do you negotiate that? How can you build strength from within? How can you have a museum, a school, a nursery, and at the same time, create the platforms to protect your community from local authorities, developers, miners? How can you do both things at the same time? It's, uh, it's very difficult. And uh, in, in this present situation, in modern world, you simply cannot live within yourself, you know, in your own close self. You have to interact with the you know, outside players. And, uh, and uh, that is, again, the part of the education, how to handle it. And uh, uh, in the education, we also have give stress uh, how to get interact with the outsiders. For example, local political leaders. Our educated tribal youth, some of them are now uh, are elected members in the local body. Some of them are working in the government offices as well. So, and uh, so this way, we have to, this uh, uh, kind of awareness, you know, when you are aware about your strength and also the dynamics that is going on outside your own village and your own life. So when you can understand both, then it will become easy to handle this situation. Again, it is not easy because the conflict of values comes in between, the perspective comes in between. And, uh, and this is what we experience is the community strength play a big role. For example, the incident that I said when they came to cut the trees, the local leaders or the timber merchant, it is the villagers who protected the area, not only our village, but from other villages from other um, community and uh, there because within these years they have understood that what we are doing what what all are doing is good for us and good for the environment good for the nature and good for everybody and when these realizations develop i think again it become very easy uh, uh, to deal with them and also the local political leaders and or the government uh, body also try to recognize you because we have to educate them some way because sometimes they always feel that oh they are vulnerable they don't say anything so you just uh, impose your decision over them so we have to give them a message that uh, we are not like that the way that you say so sometimes you have to come up with your own strength. So we, we, we make a rally. We go to the office, we go to the leaders, and we, we, we have a pressure. We create pressures on them. And you know, the political leaders or administration fear the group when community comes yeah. together. Yeah. So, Yes, so uh, we have to work in all the aspects mm. from inner self and also uh, to other outside players. There's, there's a similar uh, story which I think is also very inspiring here where I live. I live in southeast London in a ridge that used to be covered in an ancient oak forest called the Great North Wood. 
And the Great North Wood has been gradually, or over many centuries, has been felled for for um, firewood and for for timber and so on. Uh, and some pockets of it have remained. They're managed forests, but they remain uh, nonetheless. And right next door to where I live, there's a hill called One Tree Hill, which has an ancient history associated with Queen Elizabeth I, who apparently spent May Day in 1663 or something. Um, and lots of other associations with Boudicca, the Celtic queen that um, defended these lands from the Roman invasion and so on. And in the late 19th century, there was a group of developers who wanted to make a, a golf course out of that hill in the forest. And the community just got together, held hands and stood around this hill and stopped the developers with coming with their machinery to fall, fell down the trees. And they just held hands for weeks on end. And that's why the area is now circular. So the hill, you know, it's, it's now all forested with some very ancient trees. And it's a circular area. And that, that literally happened a month ago when we were part of a movement to protect two ancient oaks that were being felled again by the council. The, the, the developers were behind the initiative to cut down these trees. And a group of w women started this, this campaign and they literally just held hands around the trees and stopped the developers. Um, and throughout the world, the image of communities coming together and just simply holding hands is, is really powerful because it does stop the, the encroachment of developers and other uh, extractivists. Um, my question is, I was really moved the first time we spoke, Boro, because you said that the Adivasi feel ashamed for their role as, or I can't remember if you used the word ashamed, but you used some other word that was really strong and hit me. You said that they feel like the, the Indian state has undermined them for so many decades, if not centuries, that they feel almost embarrassed to be the guardians of the forest and to continue living in forest communities. What is the role of this kind of global community building to, to strengthen each other? Because sometimes it's really difficult to dig into our own inner strength and to hold hands. You know, you just lose the strength as a community. Do you think there is a value to creating these online global communities to, to kind of support each other and to say, you know, what you're doing is amazing. On behalf of Guardians of the Forest, this Guardians of the Forest, the one we're doing now, 312 people from around the world saying to you, the, the Santal villagers in West Bengal, that what you're doing is absolutely amazing, you know, and we're proud, honored to, to see the work you're doing. It's, is, is that something that is heard over there? Does that have value to share and, and to strengthen one another's communities in a global way? My question is more simple than that. Can technology connect us and strengthen our community fights and struggles? You're mute. Yes, uh, yes, it does. You can see the uh, reflection and how we are communicating, how we are sharing. So it does. And uh, I think uh, uh, You don't, sometimes we believe that you don't have to uh, talk around too much, but your work always speak a lot. And by which people will come to you, you don't have to go to them. People will find you out, you know. For example, I didn't contact you, but you contacted me. And that way, many people, after seeing our work, they feel oh, this is something it touches them. No? There are some things, some good work, some which is related to our uh, the works which are related to nature, uh, forest, and you know it. Uh, I think every parts of the world people are thinking on this. Mm -hmm. They are always working in their own way. We are working in our own way, they are also working. And when they hear all these things, 
And when this kind of discussion, they immediately it clicks them also, you know, it touches them. Mm -hmm. And they feel a kind of intimacy, you know, they feel, oh, they think like us, or they are working the way I was thinking so many years. So this way you can inspire others, you can motivate others, and we also motivate ourselves by listening others. So technology um, is, is a very important tool, and I think it can work uh, to serve this kind of way. Thank you, Bora. I, I, I'm listening to you. I think actions speak more than words. It's a really important thing when it comes to being a guardian, um, moving away from just rhetoric and talk and bloody blah, blah, and just get the, the, the actions to speak for themselves. Um, I, Nick? Um, yes. yes. Yeah. Shall I add something about this? Discussion. Uh, yes, yes. I wanted to ask yes. you a question, Amal, yeah. but by all means, yeah. yes, please respond oh. to the question. Yeah. yeah, especially regarding your question about the technology. Mm -hmm. So, uh, especially during the last uh, one and a half years, because of the COVID pandemic in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, we have started the online education for all children. Most of their uh, accessing. So, in that case, uh, most of families now keep in touch about the current issues because they are updating, they are connected with the internet. They are using WhatsApp, uh, Zoom and all the platforms. And then uh, especially your young generation are inspired with this technology. So they had to do it because uh, we had any option. We are closed in our schools more than one and a half years. So uh, in this year, there are so many protests in Sri Lanka against the environmental violations, environment smuggling. So uh, that, uh, because of that pressure, government had to change the way of one express way. The plan of one express way because of one tree. So that uh, protests are, protests were made on, most of on online. So uh, now, now I think it is, is very rare situation in developing countries the people did not access uh, more to the internet and such things. But Corona, this pandemic gave us some positive mm. space mm. to be connected with all type of communities and share the ideas online. So are the, what is the power holders can break the physical connections mm. among their people when they are trying to gather, but they cannot restrict the virtual space. Mm. So I think uh, this is a good opportunity to uh, inspire the forest garden mindset around the world. So, and uh, especially in third world countries. That, that's a, a wonderful point, Amal. Thank you for raising mm. it. I, I mean, we were talking about this just before before we opened the platform for our, our guardians to join how 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 heavy the impact of coronavirus has, has been in in india and i know you guys have felt it very very personally and i think it's really important to see that after the the pain and the the struggles comes an opportunity for a regeneration and comes some benefits and i and i agree with you i i in a way i think perhaps we wouldn't have created this Guardians of the Forest space if it hadn't been for coronavirus, because I myself went through a process of having to readjust as a result of, of the pandemic and not wanting to work in my university anymore, wanting to do something different. So I think it's a really important thing to mention that we are in a time of, uh, of change, uh, a, new, a new era, Pachatakutik, uh, as the Andean Amazonian indigenous people say it, it's the end of one civilization and the beginning of another one. And there's all sorts of opportunities that we can we can um, uh, grow um, in this new world that is kind of emerging after Corona. Um, and I think that's a great point. I want to ask one more question before I open the floor. I know there's loads of questions floating on the uh, on the chat, and I really want to to, to allow the guardians to ask them themselves. Um, it's the question that kind of goes back to the very first thing you, you mentioned, Boro, or one of the first things you mentioned. And you said that the Adivasi are the 
indigenous peoples of India and that they, you, uh, have a, an understanding of the world as being alive and their spirit in trees, in rivers, in stones, in people, in animals. Then um, Amal, you made a very, very important point around the role animals play in forest guardianship and conservation that we mustn't forget that the forest is a community shared between humans and trees, but also other species, deer and elephants and whatnot. So I want to ask you about the importance of learning to be a guardian, not just as a human role. You know, guardian sounds like being a, a park ranger or a policeman, but it isn't because elephants are guardians, jays are guardians, worms are guardians, fungi are guardians, also uh, trees, of course, are guardians, all living beings that care and work for the perpetuation of the forest are guardians. Could you say a little bit about that spiritual aspect of the work you do and the spirit that we share with other beings and how important it is to learn from those other beings, from, from the deer, from the elephants, from the worm, from, and not to understand guardianship, but just a human kind of role or status. What, what, what would you say about that guardianship is not just about us humans, it's about all of us living beings that are part of the forest. How important it is to recognize and feel and connect with that spirit in all those living beings. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, to understand this, uh, I think uh, uh, I would say how we first build a village. When we first start a village, then we first identify our neighbors, our areas. And these are um, trees, roads, jungles, water bodies, and, uh, and so on. And uh, we feel, as I said, that before we settle a village, here, a community, then we have to make a friendship with the spirits living in the area. And uh, for example, in our village, Vishnubhati, we have 17 such spots in the area where we believe that spirits are living. Are you there, Boro? I think we may have lost Boro for a sec. Unfortunately, because he was in mid flow. Um, while we wait for Boro to come back, Amal, would you like to to join that that discussion? Yeah, of course, Nick, I just went through some questions on the chat box. Uh, do we consider them later? I'm going to open the chat box af after this question. Um, All right, right. I paid my attention there for the questions. And uh, so I was a bit of out of the for us discussion what he was telling about. Then uh, one, uh, shall I ask, answer one question? Uh, the Nika one has mentioned about my video is not clear they are watching uh, through mobile. I'll uh, give you the link and we can share that video. I think it's- I just wanted to know what, you, what your opinion was about that question on, on the spiritual aspects of guardianship. Um, Bora was just saying that it's part of the community building um, effort. When, as far as I understood, the, the little he, allowed, he he had time to say before he, he got cut off is that when he sets the village, when the community sets the village, they connect with the world around them as neighbors. So the water bodies, the forest are all their friends and neighbors, and they create the spiritual bond between community and all the other guardians around them. How do you see that playing out in, in, in Sri Lanka? How important is that the community has a spiritual connection with the forest around them? I got yeah. yeah, 
we we're, we're hearing you amal yeah well, i think Bar Boris come back oh, okay yes well uh Nika in sri lanka yeah that's a big problem a lot of people are gathering as communities and they have some sounds uh, they are what they have wise but uh, they're in separate dimensions they have no common platform they are um, sometimes they're directed with their own political dimensions sometimes it's very specifically uh, they are driven through their or the regional factors not for the uh, not for the uh, not 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 thinking about the hard environment uh, just they just want to pass that problem from their village to another they just they just want they just ask you please establish this company please establish this uh, trade in other village so i think that's not the best thing that we that we need actually we need the development we need the industries we need the services so uh, we need the uh, we need to compromise with the environment so in such case that what we call the uh, sustainable development in such case the guardians the role of the guardian is very important uh, the problem is they are in their own worlds in separate areas and uh, no one to lead them no one to facilitate them in uh, very rare cases they got success most of them are not success in my experience in sri lanka for an example uh, there was a, a multinational company um shall i tell the name yes uh it's a chinese doll uh sorry which company yeah. doll doll d o l e doll oh doll yes yes yeah yes. yes. the doll came to sri lanka and they started a large plantation area I mean, uh, based on the residual forest area so people strictly uh, against that uh, implementation uh, because uh, that area uh, where elephants are uh, feeding and they use their habitats as the habitats so in case of that the human elephant conflict increased suddenly mm. or there was a strong uh, combination of uh, villagers and uh, communities and they protest against the toll so what happens at the end they select the leading uh, young people of that uh, uh, process and uh, built informal contacts with them and they offer good uh, packages including jobs for them in toll so they the leaders are working in toll then uh, the healers have no voice they have no guidance so actually they we can't blame people we can't criticize them because they have a lot of issues they actually people with their hand have it not sufficient income sufficient food sufficient opportunities if they have opportunity to good job they will pick it so it's really a big challenge to uh, building up a or a good platform where the people have more, more issues especially socio economic issues people first firstly in the very first they concern about their basic needs hungry shelter and such things that the some are uh, for uh, i think this discussion is a kind of uh, the kind of uh, top of the hierarchy of the human needs so mm -hmm. then the when we are going to the grassroots level people have much more problems so we have to address that, we so have to address them except that perhaps the needs are not only material mm. and physical they, i i i totally agree with that uh, material needs are top of the of the pile but human need human beings also need love spirituality and a inner yeah, yeah, it's yeah. also a need it's not a it's not an optional thing like a okay we've got all this material wealth all this developed so-called development now we can think about love care nursery mm -hmm. spiritual yeah. well-being that is a, a a a need as well um and that need is lost when development is seen as a purely economic material line of mm. 
or effort, you know, we're going to bring, come to this, doll comes to, to Sri Lanka and says, we're going to give you jobs, we're going to give you livelihood, we're going to give you salaries, we're going to give you money, you're going to buy your plasma TVs, you're going to, your houses are going to get bigger, you're going to get more food on the table. What is, what is the consequence of that type of development yeah. on well-being, psychological, affective, spiritual, which are also needs, um, very important needs, and I, 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 I hear what you're saying, there needs to be a, a, a balancing act. And that's really difficult, don't you think? Yeah. Yes, it's really difficult to balance. Yeah. So let's, yeah, I think we, I think we have to concern about this thing and uh, build up a good action or action plan, how we can address such community. So, for an example, or uh, in Sri Lanka, we did uh, some community forestry programs. We they have uh, benefit. They have benefits from the program. In such case, when we are addressing all the uh, all the issues, we should uh, put their mind into they have benefits. Sometimes they are not visible benefits. So. Uh, for example, in accounting, the concept of economy. The accounting is the basic tool to measure the profit and losses, profits or losses. They never, they never account their impact to the environment. So, but now it's a bit of trend in the world, the green accounting. So what is the actual uh, cost of production? If you are putting some poisonic things into the uh, soil and the water, which amount of our, what is the cost? We didn't include it into the cost of production. So such type of concepts, we should, I think we should uh, establish a good platform to discussion uh, concepts like green accounting. Otherwise our people need evidence. So, and uh, then the, the basic concept like the environmentalism and the human-centric development. So the human-centric development, and the, it has their own uh, logics, their own arguments to uh, legitimize this, what is going on now in the world. So, and I think we should, we, we, if we can go through somewhat of measurable, somewhat of measurable, how, how this written, what is the return of this uh, practice, the guardian practice? So we can easily justify why we should this, why we should do, why we should practice this. Uh, this is my very personal idea, though, because the, now the current world is uh, always looking about the facts and figures and uh, what is the destination of your goal, what we can reach. So I think, uh, if we should uh, concern about that point as well in our future works. Thanks, Amal. Um, Boro, are you with us? Are you hearing us? Yes, yes. I'm. I'm going to invite members of the of the um, audience to um, read their questions. Um, the first one I can see here is from Aviva. Aviva, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you for great presentations. Very inspiring, thank you. Um, so my primary question is exactly how do we connect these local initiatives or projects or um, sustainability efforts to the wider global accountability for ecocide by corporations and governments. Was that clear? Yeah, well, it's would clear. you like it is, it is, it is clear? <laughs> yeah. Could, uh, Nick, could you please explain? 
So Aviva is asking, how do you scale up the action, the community-based action, so that it addresses questions of ecocide hmm. at, a, at, a, at, a, at a larger scale? So how can community groups in, in, in the villages in West Bengal scale up their action to stop ecocide at a, at a, at a more international level? Is that Aviva, Aviva more or less what you were asking? It is. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Nick, uh, shall I contribute? Yes. No, shall Amal? I contribute something? Too? Yeah, Amal, if you yeah. want to get, get us Yeah, started. I think um, um, I have much experiences as a government uh, business. So uh, always we have to convince with the people when we are going to introduce new thing or new concept or any. Shall I admit? So um, yes, it's a scaling of the our community participation is a big trouble for such countries because we uh, we meet different levels of people, different uh, people with different education backgrounds. Their understanding capacity is different, so their expectations are different. So it's really big issue to deal with people when we are convincing, especially in uh, development projects, we call it development, but it's questionable, it's another thing. Uh, but people are driven by their own facts. So that is why I talking about that the umbrella message. We do not, we, sh we should collect some uh, physical or uh, like physical demarcations. We can collect uh, gender wise and ethnic group wise. But it's really difficult to understand who are the wealthy people and who are the poorest. This is a very competitive thing. So, and uh, how can we ask uh, after going to the village, who are the wealthiest people and who are the poorest people in the village? So, especially, we should uh, concern about all these segments and scales, scales of people. Uh, in cases of our uh, people, actually, uh, people, who are not wealthy, uh, wealthy enough, they are inherently come to come and join with that programs because they they think they will uh, come up with some return or like a payment or some uh, benefits. But uh, the people who are wealthy and elites, they do not come into the such uh, how many of the people, such a group, they will not join. So after that, the polarization started. So, and um, the, the wealthy or the high caste people or uh, elites, they consider this that the untouchable groups are going there. But in Sri Lanka, it's really uh, weak. Uh, now it's, it's not in practice, but in some rural areas, they, I think borrow. Uh, you have much experiences with dealing with this, uh, these uh, the scales, different scales of uh, society and uh, different uh, diversifications like caste, religion and in Sri Lanka. But we have to, we have to, we have to. So uh, what we are using is we are going to that people with personally and we convince with them personally and get their consent to the project. And uh, especially we are using the participatory techniques, participatory rural uh, appraisal techniques to uh, handle such a situation, to scale up the society, to amalgamate all the uh, different groups in the society. So I think so far we got success, but uh, in some issues there, actually. Boro, would you like to respond? You have to, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, one cannot stop people visiting forests or the villages or tourist spots. People are now moving around and it is also the rights to go wherever they want. We have to first understand that. But from our perspective, when they come to us and there is uh, visits or if they create our they, it creates our problem here 
then community can play as a pressure group to the administration. Always can tell that this is our problem we are having. For example, our village forest in Bollapur and uh, Santa Bolivia is when tourists are coming and government is there. So we have to sensitize them also to government and also the people coming that so that they also respect our uh, rights uh, and of peaceful living. And uh, for example, in our museum, since we live three kilometers away from Shantan Pratham, that mainstream tourist comes, we are, uh, we have a, we don't welcome random mainstream tourists. We always invite people, those who come to really know us, not to those who come to take selfies and taking photographs and just go. But we always tell them that when you come to us, you learn from us and we learn from you. So this way, uh, we always straight way tell our positions on uh, uh, every program that government takes. Three years back, the district magistrate uh, of uh, invite requested us that if they will channelize, they will channelize some tourists to our villages from Shantiketan by Bullock Cart, then we said, please you no, know, because uh, it will again will become a museum like, you know, and we will spoil our, they'll spoil our villages. So there should be a balance again. You can't uh, fully stop them. And, uh, but it, you have to always uh, come into a dialogue with the administration as well as the people in power. And uh, they have also uh, to learn us, you know, they have to, they have to learn. So often happens that people, those who come from cities to the villages, they always say, we know everything. So now in certain cases, this should other way around. There are so many things which you have to learn from us also. And uh, this uh, process should start and government should also come in uh, teaching process. So I think with this, uh, we can have a balanced development. Thank you. Yes, I, I remember Alfred Brunel saying to us, Alfred works in Liberia, in Equatorial Africa, he said, don't go on holidays anymore. Don't do tourists anymore. Go to a local village and learn from them. That's what he kind of encouraged us to do. And I think you're kind of saying something similar, Boro, that it's not about tourism, it's not going there, taking pictures of the forest and using the forest as a packaged experience, but forgetting about tourism, and going there to learn from forest peoples and to stay and to kind of deepen our understanding of forest by being with with um, people like yourselves who have such a deep intimate understanding of life in the forest so i, th I think we're hearing some something similar coming from you um can i just uh, invite anna macarthur you've got a question about pollinators would you like to share that with us yeah um can you hear me yes we can uh Thank you, Amal and Boro, for really lovely presentations. Very interesting. Um, I have a specific interest in pollinators. I've done work with them. <clears throat> and in the West, well, it's been stated that all over the world, we were seeing insect and pollinator decline. And, and it's very easy and obvious to see it in the West, but I would be interested in hearing from both of you what you witness in your forests in your areas because uh, certainly with deciduous trees and fruit trees pollinators are very important so um, I would like to hear if you witness pollinator decline um, bees obviously and what your indigenous peoples are doing to counteract that with your knowledge yes 
of course, really interesting question. Uh, thanks. Yeah, um, uh, actually, I'm a action researcher. I'm traveling all around the country. Uh, yeah, true. We have uh, this problem. Yeah, the pollination problem, especially bees. So um, actually, I think uh, Sri Lanka using a uh, high amount of uh, agrochemicals and uh, weedicides and pesticides as well. So, and uh, these are uh, considered as the main reasons to this uh, rapid decrease of the population of uh, pollinators. And uh, what government and uh, not only the government, but also some non-governmental organizations, uh, we have a uh, separate program to uh, increase the bee uh, farming. Uh, so the bee population and this bee farming projects for each and every uh, provinces. And uh, we have a separate department under the Ministry of Agriculture. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, 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 we have a separate department uh, under the Ministry of Agriculture. And uh, actually, uh, I'm not a person from uh, zoology sciences, like, uh, but my understanding, uh, we have uh, some facts and figures, which areas we should concern in this matter. So our government and some organizations distribute uh, beehives uh, without uh, charging, without charges, that the free of charge uh, to improve. It's a multi-objective project. One is to improve their livelihoods. Then uh, another thing is, uh, uh, improve their yield as well. So uh, that is the remedy uh, used by the government. And in addition, some areas people are uh, using the bees uh, as a bio repellent for the elephants. Uh, so in that case, yeah, I think uh, you're not clear. Uh, the, uh, the elephants, the, we have a human elephant conflict in Sri Lanka. So farmers are uh, doing uh, bee cultivation or beekeeping, uh, as uh, the bee, uh, they can they, they identify the bee as a uh, what do you call the the as a repellent. Uh, the elephants uh, do not like to uh, areas where bee keeping is practicing. So in that case, the farmers uh, I, I have identified for several areas. Uh, farmers uh, are practicing beekeeping, and uh, in addition. Uh, to the and in addition to minimizing the human elephant conflict, they are they got a good advantage in their harvest. So, however, we have a problem with pollinators. So, I think uh, this uh, even though we have a separate project, uh, it's uh, it cannot meet the uh, requirements of the entire country. It uh, fulfills very small amount, or I think around twenty five percent of the uh, requirement of the farmers. Can I ask, have you seen um, the, the connection with the agrochemicals? Is there a um, pushback from people of decreasing the use of agrochemicals? Yeah, 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 actually. Uh, uh, but I cannot provide the scientific proofs uh, right now. But I, I'm sure I have read, uh, I have read uh, some uh, reports in Sri Lanka not only bees, but also a uh, number of pollinators, uh, including uh, some, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, agrochemicals are using in uh, paddy lands in Sri Lanka. So um, we, uh, very recently, one of the uh, research proof, the, you may know uh, some crabs, the uh, crabs in, uh, so, uh, what did they call not in the ocean the, at the uh, yeah. farm, uh, farm yeah yes the crabs uh, then the fox are like very much uh, the crabs are the uh, main uh, step for food of the fox because the usage of agrochemicals the crabs are disappeared and as a result the fox are disappeared so uh, as a final result the population of the peacocks are highly increased now the ecological balance has been uh, broken. Therefore, uh, uh, consequently, the yield loss due to the uh, peacocks 
has dramatically increased because people do not make any harm to peacocks. They, I think uh, Bara also know the peacock is a worshipping animal in this area, even in India and uh, Sri Lanka. So people do not kill. So then predators are disappeared. Then people have no option to do. So this uh, it's a it's a very uh, result of the agrochemical usage. And pollinators had the same story. Few studies has proven that. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, what Anand said is also um, same in here in our state because of too much chemical and pesticides, using up too much chemical and pesticides. Uh, all these pollinators, all the insects and other uh, species are disappearing very rapidly. And uh, this is not only with the pollinators, also with the reduce of trash, small fishes, all the small stream or rivers and pond water are being poisoned, you know. So we no more get the you know, small fishes nowadays and uh, worms, earthworms, which is very useful for killing the soil. So with, after uh, uh, adopting this green revolution, after having green revolution about 40 years ago in India, so whole uh, biodiversity, the agriculture uh, related uh, uh, cultivation has, has got a very different uh, uh, term. So, and it's a pity that government is, of course, trying in its own way in, in, through the different projects, but the people in general still are not aware about the side effects of, of these pesticides and chemical fertilizer. But slowly now they are realizing and because of we are having too many, too much water to speak because of the global climate change. Now they realize that something is happening. Now, so we have realized from our organization, from our community, and because of that, in our school, we have started with it. So uh, uh, students take care of the beehives in the garden and how to handle them, you know, how sensitive they are. And person has, how sensitive one has to be to deal with them. And uh, before I have seen my parents or people of my age, when they used to go to the forest, they just uh, throw stones at the beehive or wild bee especially and uh, sometimes they smoke them out to extract the honey. But after going through our school, the small children, those who are growing up, they are become very sensitive. Now we find near our river, when we find a big wild beehive, they, they don't throw stones because they now tell their parents, look, you don't do that, you know, because they understand. So it, one has to touch inner self to understand this whole system, the cycle. Uh, through reading and writing, one cannot understand unless one uh, goes through this and also, uh, you know, understand from within, inside. So it is very difficult to uh, just tell. So that is our our program that we are doing. Thank you. Nick, I, I would like to uh, tell one thing that that's, um, I'm not remember that name of uh, that. You'd like uh, to what, sorry? Yeah, I, I would like to give some information for that uh, lady. I could, I'm sorry, I couldn't remember your name. Anna MacArthur. Yeah, Anna MacArthur. So Sri Lanka has decided to ban all types of uh, chemical fertilizer and agrochemicals 
Uh, now it's implemented onwards next uh, cultivation season. Uh, Sri Lanka will not use chemical uh, fertilizer or agrochemicals. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah. We've been together for two and a half hours. It felt like 10 minutes, but time flies when you're having fun. And um, I just wanted to say one thing about what we are doing, the Guardians Worldwide. We're going to do a, um, a course next year called Little Guardians. It's going to be a, a course for, for, for kids. And I hope, Boro, that we can, we can do a, a partnership with your school so that kids over here can learn from you even if through virtual means, but that inner strength that you were talking about is something that we would love to share with our children. So we're setting up this uh, course called Little Guardians in the summer of next year to create connections between different local indigenous uh, or grassroots uh, forest schools with kids here in, in the UK and in the US. So it would be a wonderful opportunity that to get the kids to um, to learn what we're learning in this in this space. So um, something to be continued. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for another wonderful evening or morning, wherever, depending where you are in the world. And uh, a very special thanks to Amal and Boro. Um, it's not just, just wonderful what you're saying. The way you're saying it is wonderful as well. It's just with this kind of calm and very warm uh, manner and, and and it's wonderful really so thank you so much for your time and i can i invite everyone here in guardians of the forest please get in touch with amal and Boro. keep asking your questions and and strengthening the connections we're making but um thank you very much i, I don't know if you would like to finish off with your final words amal and Boro, a short final word of, of wisdom hmm to leave us with a smile. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, actually, I think uh, we should share something important. There, we uh, came uh, through some difficult eras of the world uh, centuries, centuries ago with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and um, after turning back to our history, what we has achieved can we are happy about our, about our history. Uh, for example, China says we have the Great Wall. For, yes, that's a good symbol, but uh, it's a symbol of the failure. If you have no enemies, why you should build a wall? So we are, the history shows our weak points. So I think it's a really, really important uh, activity because the uh, entire world is healing as a result of the climate change. And uh, as a Sri Lankan, Sri Lanka is top ranked in the top five countries for last consecutive five years, back to back floods and landslides, tsunami, a lot of, a lot of it. And now, uh, I think it's the time, it's time is ready. Not ready, actually we are too late <laughs> to respond, to respect the nature, to respect the, all, human, uh, all uh, animals, all creatures. So not only think about the human. I, 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 I think that all of the people in this gathering, we have the same idea. So our, we should, we should uh, broadcast our ideas. I, as I proposed, Nick, uh, now the third world countries, the young generation of the third world countries, are they are much sophisticated, much energetic. They are keeping in touch with the technology, especially school children. So, and they are, they are still not matured. When after getting matured people, we, uh, it's really, uh, really difficult to change their set of mind. So the growing uh, generation, they are really, they are, uh, they, are, they are looking for new knowledge. So we can address that such community with the help of this uh, technology. So I think we can make a better place for everyone. So 
I think, uh, and, and in addition, and finally, I would like to appreciate our Forest Guardians' uh, work, uh, Ruby and uh, Nick and Christopher, and all the participants and all the uh, resource persons. And uh, let's do it. Never give up. Reach the top. Yeah, thank you, Amal. And uh, uh, thank you, Nick, for uh, everything, because uh, I thank all the members of the Forest Gardens and for the opportunity they have given us to share our uh, ideas. And uh, I believe uh, this kind of sharing, uh, we become more mature, you know, and we become more conscious about our surroundings, about our nature. And I think we become more mature when we uh, give more importance uh, to the little things, you know, as you said, the walls, the name, and little, little uh, things. And uh, I think that is what Gajan is always talking about. And uh, I think uh, we should uh, keep going and keep in touch. And uh, I'm always there, as you have said. So if anybody wants to come to us or come to work, just welcome. And uh, once again, I think everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Boro. Thank you, Amal. Thanks, everyone. Um, another session is over. There's only one more left to go. So, um, but the learnings stay there for a long time. They're very deep and transformative. So thank you very much. We'll see you next week, Guardians. We will be graced by the presence of two wonderful people, two more wonderful people. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Um, Alistair McIntosh and Mina Susana Setra, who will be talking about Indonesia and uh, Papua New Guinea and Scotland. And we will trying to we'll be trying to wrap up this whole journey. So uh, thank you, everyone. And see you next week. Thank you, thank you all so much. It's been amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Boro and Amal and Nick and everyone. Thank you. Nick. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you so much for all. Thank you. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.